Thank you, Jerry. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining me for First Fridays on a Thursday. How about that? Well, I'm going to start with a question for all of you. Does anyone know how many hours a day we spend with email? How many hours a day with email? Too many is a really good guess, but I'm looking for a specific number of hours. Does anyone know? One is a good guess, but it's too low. Five is a closer guess. Six is the right answer. Six hours a day, according to a study by Adobe, we spend six hours a day with email. In addition to that, it's estimated that we spend about two hours a day with social media. Now, remember, these are averages. So you're going to know some people who spend no time with social media. Then we have, on the other end of the spectrum, people like Jerry Johnson, who spend eight hours a day on TikTok, making videos. <laughs> But these are, of course, averages. And in addition to that, we spend about three hours a day watching TV. Now, when you add these numbers up, it's kind of amazing that we ever get work done or ever get any sleep. But that's not the only thing that we have to consume. Because thanks to your friends in the marketing industry, we see somewhere between six and 10,000 ads every day. Well, the bottom line is this. There's a lot of competition for our attention today. And the old ways of communicating no longer work. When it comes to leadership, we need to find a better way to communicate with our audiences in order to engage them. And as leaders, one of the things we do is we default to what we've seen other leaders done over the years. And that usually consists of people standing in front of you, spouting mission statements, sharing data, PowerPoints with bullet points, and those all have their place. But if we want our messages to have any chance of cutting through in today's environment, we need to tell more stories. Today I'm going to talk about why stories are such a powerful thing, talk about why they matter. Then we're going to talk about what most people do that I think you shouldn't do as frequently as you may be doing it now, and I say that with all due respect, and talk about what I'd encourage you to do instead, to do more frequently. And then we're going to have a chance to work on this hands-on. You're going to have some time today to develop a story important to you. And I'm going to focus on your role as leaders, and I'm going to have you work on a story relevant to an organization that's important to you. Now, that could be the organization you work for. It could be a story about the product or service that you sell. But it also could be a story that you want to tell your team to get them engaged. It could be a story you want to tell prospective employees to help them see why you would be a great employer. It could be a story about an organization you advocate for as a, as a volunteer or as, a fund, as someone who gives money to the organization. Doesn't matter. But an organization that you're involved with as a leader, you'll have a chance to work on a story relevant to that. I'm going to give you some best practices as we lead into that part of the conversation. But let's start with why stories matter. Well, the fact of the matter is, the bottom line, is that stories have a different effect on us than other ways of communicating. This is said really well by Billy Howard, who's the author of a book called We Commerce. She says this, she says, rational engagement is based on the stimulation of the mind, whereas emotional engagement is based on the stimulation of the heart. In today's age, that's an important phrase, we'll come back to it. In today's age, emotional engagement is proving to be more and more critical and effective storytelling is at the heart of this movement. Now, I want to focus on what's different about today's environment and why storytelling is even more important in 2021. One of the first reasons why it's so critically important kind of is because of what I referenced in the intro. We're all dealing with information overload. If you're listening to us virtually, raise your virtual hand. If you're in the room, raise your actual hand if you're feeling this. If you feel like there's too much information coming at you all the time. All right, most of the hands are going up. Yes, and when we're dealing with information overload, it makes it really difficult to retain the details, things like data. Again, data is important, it has its place, but on its own, it's not enough to do the job. This point is made really well by author Stephanie Scotty who says we're bombarded by facts and data all day, every day. And this means unless something stands out, it goes in one ear and out the other. The way to make data stand out is to embed it in a story. So we know that we have a lot of information coming our way. The other thing we're dealing with, especially of course over the last year, is social isolation. And one of the few things that mitigates social isolation is stories about people. It's a way we can connect even when we can't connect in person. 
But it's important to note that these are trends that have been developing for a long time. Certainly the pandemic increased social isolation in a way that many of us have never experienced before. But social isolation has been increasing over the years, perhaps surprisingly to hear, because of technology and social media. There are factors with social media that make us more isolated from each other. One of the ways we can still connect, even when we're distant from each other, is through stories. And this one's critically important as well. Authenticity has never been more important, and stories are a different way of conveying authenticity. Let me explain this one, because it's something I think that's underappreciated. Our communication environment has changed dramatically even in the past 30 years. When I was growing up as a child of the 70s and 80s, the vast majority of messages that I saw in the mass media environment were scripted, delivered by paid talent, and produced with Hollywood production values, right? There's still some of that in today's environment, of course. You know, we still watch produced TV shows and ads are still produced with paid talent and scripts and all those things. But more and more, the media we're consuming is not Hollywood production values, it's produced by people like us. It is media we're consuming through social media produced by our family and friends. So what that's led to is we as consumers of media now have really highly attuned BS meters. If something looks fake, if it's too scripted, if it's delivered by someone who is too perfect, or if it doesn't sound like speech, we don't trust it. One of the ways to get around that is by sharing stories that deliver the authenticity people are looking for. Now, all of this is true, but it's also backed by science. There was a study done recently at Princeton University that was led by this person, his name is Yuri Hassan. The title of the study is Speaker Listener Neural Coupling Underlies Successful Communication. Now, my abilities as a scientist are limited to being able to read the title of this study. I actually did try to read it, and I quickly remembered why I failed chemistry in my junior year of high school and had to take it over as a summer class, because I didn't understand any of it, but I did find a really great translation that was given to us by this person's name is Leo Widrick. He wrote an article about this study called The Science of Storytelling, What Listening to a Story Does to Our Brains. And he says this. He says, if we listen to a PowerPoint presentation with boring bullet points, certain parts in the brain get activated. Scientists call these Broca's area and Wernicke's area. Overall, it hits our language processing parts in the brain where we decode words into meaning and that's it. Nothing else happens. In other words, we hear the information, we understand the information, and we move on to the next of the thousand messages that are inevitably waiting for us. He goes on to say, however, when we're being told a story, things change dramatically. Not only are the language processing parts in our brain activated, but any other area in our brain that we would use when we experience the events of the story are activated too. What this leads to is the fact that a story can put your whole brain to work, and whenever we hear a story, we want to relate it back to one of our own experiences. To put this another way, when we tell a story to an audience, it becomes their story too. Now, this point <clears throat> is really important to understand. Again, I'm not saying that data doesn't matter, but where we have the best opportunity to deliver data is through stories. This point is made by Jonah Berger in his book, Contagious, where he says this. He says, people don't think in terms of information. They think in terms of narrative. But while people focus on the story itself, information comes along for the ride. So if as a leader, one of your goals is to share some data, the best way to do that is to embed that data in a story. So let's look at this in practice. And I'm gonna share some examples of what I see happening too often and what I would recommend that you not do, at least as, not as often as you may be doing it today, and share an example of what I recommend you do instead. So really critical for me to stress with these first couple examples, I'm going to be playing a role of the average leader delivering the average message about the average organization, right? So the first couple examples I'm gonna give you, I wanna stress, it's what I don't think you should do. But I am going to use a real organization for these examples. The organization I'm going to use is Fort Wayne Trails, as I share what many people do. I'm gonna talk about Fort Wayne Trails, an organization I really do advocate for. I've had the good fortune to be on the Fort Wayne Trails board for the last few years. It's an organization I really love. But when most leaders have the opportunity to present information about organizations, 
it tends to sound like this. So if I were standing in front of you and you gave me the opportunity to Fort Wayne, talk about Fort Wayne Trails, I might say this. Fort Wayne Trails, our mission is to be a community partner and advocate with the municipal partners in the development of a connected multi-purpose system of trails in Allen County, Indiana. With all due respect to whoever wrote this mission statement, who's excited? <laughs> right? Listen to that. Wow, doesn't sound much like speech, right? Doesn't sound very authentic. <clears throat> and let me ask you a really genuine question. <clears throat> what do you now know? Let's assume that coming into this conversation, you knew nothing about Fort Wayne Trails, or you were only equipped with a little bit of information about Fort Wayne Trails. What would you now know about Fort Wayne Trails based on this? Anything? Okay, you would know it's in Allen County. <laughs> yeah, I lost most of you when I said the word municipal. You wanted to run screaming from the room, right? So yeah, you know there's probably government connections. You know it's in Allen County, but isn't that kind of obvious given the fact that it's Fort Wayne Trails? And you know that it is a connected multi-purpose system of trails, but again, you know that from the name. So I really haven't said anything, haven't said much at all. And this is reflective of one of the problems that we run into is that we over rely on mission statements. I have a long history of being a critic of mission statements, and here's why. I think most mission statements, yes, they play a role, but most of them are crafted in closed rooms, and this is pre-COVID and post-COVID, in closed rooms by well-meaning people, and it becomes this Frankenstein's monster of words, because one person says, well, we have to use the word municipal, another person says it has to be only one sentence, and the only reason the mission statement ever gets written is because everybody wants to get out of that closed room and move on with the rest of their life. So everybody compromises, and as a result, it's not very good. This point is made really well in the book Made to Stick by Chip and Dan Heath, who say mission statements are often ambiguous to the point of being meaningless, as opposed to naturally sticky ideas, which are full of concrete images. Speaking concretely is the only way to ensure that our idea will mean the same thing to everyone. Right, so mission statements don't mean much. They have their role, but they're not great if you really want to convey information about an organization. Now let me give you another example of what leaders often do when given the opportunity to speak on behalf of their organization. They will stand up in front of a group like this and they will start spouting bullet points. They will say things like, uh, Fort Wayne Trails was founded in 2011 when three advocacy groups, Aboit New Trails, Northwest Allen County Trails Inc., and the Greenway Consortium joined forces. We're a 501c3. We are a community partner and advocate with municipal partners in the development of a connected multi-purpose system of trails in Allen County, that old chestnut, and we have more than 120 miles of trail. Who here is excited? Anybody? No. And, and furthermore, what does this tell you? Now, it's a little bit more information than just the mission statement, but let's say you knew nothing about Fort Wayne trails coming into this conversation and I spouted these bullet points in your general direction, what would you now know? You know a little bit more, what else might you know? Yes, this person knows what a 501c3 is. Congratulations, yes, it's a nonprofit. Okay, what else do you know? 120 miles, that's good, that's a step in the right direction. But let me ask you this, based on this information, two months from now, two weeks from now, two days from now, if I stopped you on the street and said, how many miles of trail does Fort Wayne Trails have, would you remember that? Maybe, but if you're like most people, maybe not. So the bottom line here is, back to what Leo Widrick said, is when you as a leader convey information in this way to an audience, they kind of get the facts, they know what they know, and that's it. It's not really this approach designed to spur people on to any kind of production, productive action. So now let me share with you what I'd encourage you to do instead. And no surprise at this point in the conversation, I'm going to encourage you to share more stories. So if I had the opportunity to speak on behalf of Fort Wayne Trails, I might tell you a story about Ashley and her son Tyson. So Ashley, like a lot of people over the course of the last year, has been spending a lot of time at home, as has her son. And she has been really eager for ways to get her son safely out of the house, to learn, to connect with nature, and to have some variety in his life. The problem is, Tyson would rather stay inside. He'd rather be connected to video games, 
watch TV, and all the things that she's trying to get him to do less of. So after encouraging him over and over again, she finally got him to use a stretch of trail by their house. And it just so happens that she lives right by the Parkview Y. And it just so happens that Tyson's favorite thing in the world is turtles. And as they're walking down the trail, Tyson finds this swampy, marshy area that just happens to have a lot of turtles. So now Ashley's problem isn't getting Tyson to go out on the trail, it's getting him away from the turtles and getting him back home. And that's what Fort Wayne Trails does throughout its 120 miles now in county. It connects people to each other, it connects people to their neighbors, it connects them to nature, it connects them to opportunities to be active for free in a safe way. Now my suspicion is that you're saying, okay, what else? Because I didn't tell you everything about Fort Wayne Trails, and that's not the goal. In addition, that wasn't perfect, it wasn't scripted, but that's kind of the point, is to make it conversational, to make it something that's going to hit your ear in a different way. Here's the whole idea, again, from the book Made to Stick. They say that to make our communications more effective, we need to shift our thinking from what information do I need to convey to what questions do I want my audience to ask. The bottom line is today, your audience is not gonna care unless they're part of the conversation. The reason for this is pretty simple, and this is as old as communication itself. Today's audiences, and we're all members of today's audience, we're always thinking in terms of a five-letter acronym, W-I-I-F-M. Does anyone know what that means? What's in it for me? It's what we're always thinking when anyone communicates any message to us. It's not because we're selfish, it's because it's 2021 and we're human. And there's so much information coming our way that we have to be great at deciding very quickly what's relevant to me and the people I care about and what isn't. If I decide it's not relevant, I'm moving on to one of the 1,000 messages that's inevitably waiting for me. If it is, then I might want to learn more. So as leaders, if you can get people engaged in a conversation, not by telling them the whole story, not by telling it perfectly, but by being a human telling a story, they're gonna be eager to hear the rest of it. So now let's talk about you <clears throat> and the organizations important to you and how you can develop stories relevant to your roles as leaders. The, the question I wanna ask all of you, and feel free to play along at home if you wanna share any thoughts in chat, what are some of the elements of a great story? What are some things that make a great story? What ideas do you have? Yes? Yeah, absolutely. It's got to be about people. It's not about people. People will not care about it. You can make the best widget in the world. If you tell me the difference between that widget and another widget, I might care a little bit, but I'm probably not going to care as much as if you connect that to how it benefits people. Great answer. All right, what else makes a great story? Dave? Happy ending. Happy ending. Yeah, and I'm gonna challenge you here for a second. I know Dave, so I can challenge him. How do you get to a happy ending? What has to happen before you get to the happy ending? Yeah, there has to be, those of you who took, you know, Writing classes will remember the rising action and the falling action, yes. So there has to be a little bit of drama, it doesn't have to be high drama, but for sure there has to be something at stake that leads to everyone being happy at the end. What else? Jared? Yeah, yeah. Someone who accomplishes something noteworthy because they see potential in themselves, absolutely. Yes? Yep. Yep, for sure. Yep, so it's specific, uses touch points that we all can recognize. Anything else come to mind? Yes? 100%. Yeah, you guys are great. You don't need me. You've got this figured out. So let's synthesize this. It's specific. Going back to the point made by the lady in the back, yes. Don't try to be all things to all people. Don't try to say everything. If in today's environment you try to be all things to all people or you try to say everything, you're going to say nothing to anyone, right? Trust that your story is great. Tell a little bit of it 
and then people will ask to hear more of the story. Absolutely, authenticity matters. Again, don't be overscripted. Don't rehearse your story other than thinking about what are the key elements. Don't script it, deliver it like a human being, make it authentic. And it's gotta be true, by the way, because we have such highly attuned BS meters today, if it smells fake, people are going to run in the other direction and your brand will be eroded in a way that may be hard to recover from. And absolutely, it's gotta be memorable. It's got to be something that people are likely to remember two days, perhaps two weeks, perhaps even two months down the line. So how do you do that? What should you include in your story in order to make sure that it's effective? Now, this is where you might wanna take a note or two because you're gonna work on your stories in just a minute. But some of the things that absolutely must be included, you hit the nail on the head in the back, it's gotta be about people. Somehow your story has to come back to how it benefits people or with all due respect, no one's gonna care. It's gotta convey emotion as Dave said, has to have something at stake in order to have everyone live happily ever after. They have to be not so happy at some point, right? And it makes the audience want to learn more. So, Here's what we're gonna do next. You're gonna have a chance to work on a story about an organization important to you. And again, some examples. Could be the organization you work for and why you believe someone should hire you and trust in your product or service, but it doesn't have to be that. It could be about why your organization is a great place to work. It could be a story about an organization you advocate for, why you believe it's worthy of support of some kind. It, it doesn't matter. And taking a literal page out of the book series that some of you will remember from the 80s and 90s, I'm gonna give you the opportunity to choose your own adventure, to give you some thought starters, because I know I'm dropping this on you out of nowhere, this assignment, dropping, you, dropping it on you out of nowhere at 8.30 a.m. on a cold Thursday morning. So to warm us up a little bit, here are some possibilities. It might be the organization's origin story. Why was the organization founded? by whom, and what problem was the organization intended to solve? What is your mission story? Please no mission statements. Your mission story, your mission in action. What do you do? Who does it help? Why does it matter? A story that differentiates your organization. Why do you think your organization is better than competing organizations? Why do you think you're worthy of time and attention? A story about the organization's values. What do you want the organization to be known for or known as? And what stories can you tell that reflect those values? Or it could be a story that encapsulates your vision. Where do you want the organization to go? What would it look like if you were to achieve that? Now, if you have a better idea, go for it. There, is a, there are a lot of different stories you could tell, but these are just thought starters. So what I'd like you to do is to take five minutes. Now, you might be saying five minutes isn't a lot of time. The goal here is to start. If you get it perfect, great. But if you get started, you still win. So take five minutes, and those of you who are following along at home, please do the same. Take five minutes. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna roam around at a safe distance and eavesdrop. And if you get stuck, just raise your hand and I will help you. If you get stuck online, just drop a note into chat and I will try to help you or someone else will. But the goal is to get started. So with that in mind, I'm going to start the timer for five minutes and Tell us your story, and then I'll have a few volunteers, a few brave volunteers, tell us what they have to share. Yeah. All right, we have our first volunteer to share her story, and your name is please? Emily. Emily, the blue box is yours. Tell us your story. <laughs> Mental illness, addiction, past trauma, these are all causes of homelessness. But these aren't the leading reasons a mother begins living in her car with her children. It's a lack of healthy relationships. At the rescue mission, we believe hope starts with a meal, which is why we invite the community in 365 days a year for three hot meals a day. This may be the starting point to building trust and a relationship that leads to real change. Excellent, let's give her a round of applause. All right. So what did you hear in that that you liked? Someone name a couple things you liked. What'd you like? Hot meals. Yep. Dave likes hot meals. We've learned that today. Okay, good. Yes. We, we started with the problem and we got to the resolution. Excellent. Great job. All right. What's your name, please? Amy Lang Graff. All right. Amy, the blue box is yours. Tell us your story. All right. 
So this is one of my favorites. I have a colleague at my work, we'll call him Joe, it's not his real name. Um, he used to work as a software developer, developer for an organization that required him to work 70 hours a week and then offshored his job. So he was laid off. A Couple months later, he comes to work for us. He's sitting at the lunch table with a group of people and says, hey, I have this RC car. It's a monster truck at home. It runs on diesel fuel. I'm wondering if any of you would know how I could turn that into an electric model and build an app on my phone to drive it down to Coney Island and go get our order from them. Our office leader is sitting next to him and hears his story and says, you know what, you should put a project team together and we'll pay you guys to do that on the bench and we'll use that for our recruiting. And I just love how our developers get to use their creativity at a company that allows them to do this on work time because it teaches them new skills. Excellent. All right, give her a round of applause. Do we have any more volunteers? All right, come on up. Let's give them a round of applause. This is courageous. All right, good. Jerry, the blue box is all yours. Tell us your story. Okay. Ben and Ann were taking a trip with their family to Germany. And they had everything planned out perfectly. And they got on their train to go from Berlin at 11 o'clock at night and make a transfer about an hour later into a sleeper compartment. And they're going to arrive in Germany, in Austria, Salzburg, to take a sound of music tour the next morning. As they were traveling along, they got to the train station, and it was about midnight. And as they gave their ticket to get onto the sleeper car, the ticket master said, This is for tomorrow. We are full. And Ben started kicking himself as his little girl started to cry. And she said, where will we sleep tonight? And he kicked himself and said, why did I insist on doing everything myself? Why didn't I have another set of eyes check me? Why didn't I ask for help? All right, Jerry, thank you. Let's give him a round of applause. All right. So here's the thing, if you, that set the bar pretty high, right? We had some really great stories. If you had one that was as good, congratulations, you win. Now, if you have only half of that, congratulations, you still win because you started. The next time you go to do this, it will be easier. What if you have a completely blank sheet of paper and you tried? Well, you still win because this is hard to do. It's not what we're used to do. It's not what we've seen others do, but the key is to get started. So here's some really good news. I started out by talking about how crowded and cluttered our communication environment is, but it's also the best time ever to tell stories. Let me explain why. When I started my career, and this is going to reveal my inner dinosaur, but when I started my career, there was no commercial internet. I did not have an email address in my first job after college. If I wanted to tell my story, a story about an organization important to me, as a result of that, my options were tell people my story face to face, call them on the phone, send them postal mail. I think I could fax my story to them at that point. Or I could plead with the news media to share my story, which isn't going to happen very often. The bottom line is, as recently as 30 years ago, it was really difficult to do what we're talking about today. Today, it's easy. You have the opportunity to tell any story you want from anywhere at any time through long form content creation. By that I mean starting a blog, sharing video, starting a podcast, being on someone else's podcast, doing photo storytelling, starting an event like First Fridays, being a presenter at an event like First Fridays. It's all available to you. You can do anything you want if you have a great story to tell and I'm certain most of you do. And there's one last thing I wanna share with you. You know, when we talk about sharing your story, 
It's about generating more advocacy for the, import, for, the, for the organizations that are important to you. So your story, the stories you tell, especially in today's environment when there's so much competition for attention, the story you tell is gonna define the opportunities available to you in your organization. And over time, what you make of those opportunities is going to define your legacy. So with that, I want to say thank you very much for your time and attention. It's been a pleasure being with you on a Thursday at First Friday. And good luck as you move ahead telling your story. Thank you very much.